Hello everyone, welcome to the TriStar Gym channel. Today's episode, I am doing an AMA and ask me anything. I'm answering your questions that you sent in at Zahabi Gmail, excuse me, at Zahabi Mailbag at gmail.com. Thank you for sending your sending in your questions. I got hundreds and hundreds of questions. If you want to send me more questions, check the description. My email is there. My email for this these type of episodes is there and you guys can send me all the questions you like. I sift through a bunch of them and picked out the best ones and I think they're going to make for a very interesting episode. And uh, if you guys are liking these episodes, I will do more. I'm obviously still going to be doing technique uh, technique videos and breakdowns and stuff like that. But sometimes it's just fun to go into and ask me anything and uh, see what you guys are thinking and have a little bit of a fun episode. Okay, so I'm going to jump in. Before I jump in, I want to give a special thank you to TimTam.Tech. They make the world's best deep tissue device. If you train and you need recovery like we all do, get a TimTam. I guarantee you, I've never heard anybody buy one and regret it. It's one of the best devices to keep your body healthy and recover. Check out TimTam.Tech and um, try the device and let me know your thoughts. Okay, so here we go. First question here is from Mikas. Mikas asks, hello for us. You always recommend Peter Drucker and Rene Descartes books, Managing Oneself and Meditations. I've read them both. Can you recommend more books that helped you grow as a man and as a coach? Great question. Thank you, Mikas. Yes, I have the the Peter Drucker book right here. I don't know if you guys can see it here. It's a great book. This is a book I recommend to everyone. Now, Peter Drucker, who's Peter Drucker? Peter Drucker has written 40 books, 38 of, of which are on management. He's, he's known as the grandfather of management. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. Anything you've learned in university or in schools about management, it all draws on Peter Drucker's book, books. So his most important book is this little tiny book. Out of the 38 books he wrote on management, this little 45-minute read is probably the best work he's ever done. And if you look at the cover here, if you just take a quick look at the cover, it's a dot and a square, and inside the square, there's another little dot. And, and what that is, that square over there that you're looking at, it's a mirror. And this book is titled Managing Oneself. He's talking about managing you first, before you manage your store, before you manage your career, before you manage your, your, your family, whatever, whatever you're trying to manage. First, you have to manage yourself. It's such a brilliant, brilliant book. What does it do in the book? It's just basically, look, do a self-assessment, see what your strengths are, see what your weaknesses are, and accentuate your strengths. And now this is such an important, important uh, lesson for everybody. You know, there's often a criticism um, in regards to our schooling system. Our schooling system takes a young child, and the young child might be gifted in some way, and they're going to say that this child is mediocre. Why? Because the child is not doing good in French or in mathematics or in geography. He's doing very poorly in, in, in a few areas. And he might be shining in the arts or he might be shining, shining in gymnastics or, uh, or gym, I should say. Or he's shining in, in mathematics or whatnot. But because he doesn't have an average intelligence, because he doesn't have an average understanding of the other um, elements of, of learning, they'll give him a poor average. And a poor average will least lead to a failed grade or a failed year. At least that's how it works here in the West. Now, th this Peter Drucker would say, look, that's a ridiculous way to raise children. Some of these children are going to be gifted and you're going to stifle them. You're going to stifle their gifts. Now, we know throughout history, many, many, many successful people had really poor grades. Many successful people dropped out of school and became extremely successful because they had a talent and school was not, um, was not uh, I'm sorry, um, cultivating that talent. So what does Peter Drucker say? He says, look, everybody's got a talent. Sit there, look yourself in the mirror, find out what your best talents are, find out what your strengths are and play those cards. It is very few people that will make a success, that will be successful strengthening their weaknesses he makes such an incredible point and um i think it's very true for fighters for athletes you know some fighters i always tell people there are so many ways to become world champion look at all the world champions that have ever been legitimate world champions so many of them had different styles so many of them had different styles um uh, cormier Dan daniel cormier doesn't fight like miosic and Miosik doesn't fight like George St. Pierre. And George St. Pierre didn't fight like BJ Penn. And these guys all did it differently. Hafa Mendez doesn't, doesn't grapple like a Paul Harris. You know, and you could not, you could not do a bigger disservice than taking a Paul Harris and telling him, look, don't do leg locks, just do butterfly guard. Could you, I always tell students, could you imagine if Paul Harris was training under a Marcelo Garcia? Marcelo Garcia is a brilliant trainer. 
He's a legend. He's one of the greatest jiu-jitsu guys of all time. But a Paul Harris needs to train with a John Danaher. You know, that he, he will have more success training with a John Danaher. And there are students that have a greater success training with a Marcelo Garcia. You must do a self-assessment. That is number one. That is why I always recommend this book. And it's a 45-minute read if you haven't read it. You know, incidentally, uh, Harvard, the Harvard Business Review, they did the 10 must-reads on, on management. And this is number one. Number one is Peter Drucker's Managing Oneself. That's how I found it. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. This, the lesson is super simple. But it's a super powerful one. I find that a lot of people go through a lot of heartache in life because, simply because, they're not exploiting their natural talents. They're trying to fit into a mold that they're not made for. I always tell my students, could you imagine if Muhammad Ali tried to fight like Tyson? He would be a below average or average level fighter. Could you imagine if Mike Tyson tried to fight like Muhammad Ali? Circling towards the power side, cracking out jabs, never going to the body. Could you imagine a Mike Tyson? You know, Muhammad Ali never threw any body shots. Could you imagine Mike Tyson adopting that philosophy? It would backfire. Okay, so the way I formulated a TriStar gym is between from white belt to blue belt, you're not really specializing. You're just doing the basics. You're sharpening the basics and the the, the generic basics, the real armbar triangle omoplata the not so spicy sexy uh, beautiful uh, awe inspiring techniques the plain beaten potatoes techniques those are the techniques you're going to develop once you're a purple belt now it's time to really decide are you a half guard guy are you a leg lock guy are you a guillotiner are you a variety of of, of positions your go-tos now is the time to start specializing okay but i don't believe in specializing on day one so i have a bit of a balance in my in my approach but i truly believe 100 percent at one one point you have to kind of drop the basics a bit and make the basics mold towards you make you take you keep taking the basics to the higher and higher levels however you mold them to you if you got really long arms and your trainer is telling you that a darts is not a good choke and that uh uh, you know, anacondas are not a good choke for you. Your your trainer does not understand. Your trainer maybe does not understand that his attributes are very different than yours. So, if you're a leg locker or you're 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 a guillotine guy, you'll know once you reach that purple purple belt level. So that's my answer to you. You asked me if I recommend any other books. Well, yes, I have a long list of books I would recommend. But uh, if you're talking about, you said I believe you said grow as a coach if you want to grow as a coach what I, what book would i recommend i would recommend laney basham's material laney basham he wrote a really really great book it's called winning in mind with winning in mind by laney basham with winning in mind i believe he has a website where i have i bought my book uh my laney basham books on his website but i think they're also on itunes now i believe they've been put on itunes but you can buy also his uh, his audio versions he also sells the audio versions you guys might not know, but I'm more about uh, audiobooks. You can also get this on audiobook. I, I didn't actually read this book. I, I listen to it. I'm a big listener. Again, those are my strengths. Once I realized that I was more of a listener than a reader, my my consumption of books, you know, uh, quadrupled. You know, I'm much I'm a much better listener than I'm a reader. Some people got to read it. Some people prefer to listen to it. I'm a listener. So you can get this book on Audible. You can get... Um, Laney Basham's on iTunes, if I remember correctly. I did buy all my Laney Basham material on his site, but I do believe it's also on iTunes now. And he has a second book that's really phenomenal. It's called Freedom Flight. Check out Freedom Flight by Laney Basham. I promise you, you will not regret it. It's a 45-minute read, maybe a one hour if you, if you stop to really like think about it. Um, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. Those will help you with your coaching and your 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 mental strength i would say another excellent excellent book that i just i don't want to recommend books without recommend re recommending this one tim uh timothy galway timothy galway rather the inner game of tennis the inner game of tennis now it could be the inner game of jiu-jitsu inner game of mma that's irrelevant he's talking about the inner game of sports okay so his title the title of his book just so happens to be inner game of tennis give it a listen because you can get it on audible again i, I listen to it on audible or you can buy the book and read it <clears throat> i recommend uh, you pick up inner game of tennis it is a phenomenal phenomenal book and i'm sure you will enjoy it your other question here is second question i always have 
psychological problems before big competition and my nerves get the better of me. Mostly I have fear of failure and disappointing others. Maybe you can give me any tips on, or just a few words to calm me, calm a fighter down before fights. Now, listen, this is such a common question. I probably got this question 50 times uh, in the last week. So I'm going to answer it now. Okay, so Mikas, thank you for sending in that question. It is a very, very a deep, deep question. There are so many ways to approach it. Obviously, in MMA, it is probably, it. MMA is, without a doubt, the scariest sport today. There's no scarier sport unless you go back to the gladiator days, unless you go uh, talking about warfare. And, and in terms of sports, there is nothing more scary, in my opinion, than actual fighting. Okay, fighting. So we deal with this on a regular basis. Of course, fighters have nerves. Fighters are human. They have the same emotions as everybody else. They go through fear, nerves, anxiety. How do we deal with it? Well, number one, I always say this, okay, and, and, uh, uh, and just a little side note. I am also writing a book, but it's actually an audio book, okay? So I'm going to be coming out with a book eventually, hopefully late 2018, early 2019. I'm going to have an audio book. It won't be a written book. Again, I'm more verbal. I'm more audio. I'm going to be doing it myself. It's not ghost written, nothing like that. It's going to be an audiobook made, written by me or, or spoken by me, and it'll be uh, touching on these topics. Okay, so I'll give you a much thorough, much more deep analysis on how to get over your fears and nerves, etc. But for here, for just now, <clears throat> to perform without fear, to perform and feel that great feeling of confidence, there's a two part process. One, it's all physical. I always say the training is 99% physical, 1% mental, far from your event. So so don't jump the gun just yet. Okay, so six months before my fight, three months before my fight, it's all about the physical. Am I training? Am I putting in the rounds? Am I getting the subs? Am I, am I landing the shots and sparring? Am I doing everything right? Am I showing extreme competence? The more competence I show in the practice room, the more confidence I will have coming up to the fight. Now, the closer and closer I get to the fight, the more it becomes mental and the less it becomes physical. So the night before the fight, it's 99% mental now and 1% physical because you're not going to be training. You're not going to be adding more endurance. You're not going to be adding more physical strength the night before. So you understand three months before, it's all about the physical training and 1% mental. Why? It's 1% mental because there's very little stress. The fight is far from now. The danger is not immediate. As the fight gets closer and closer, till right before you're about to walk out to your event. Now it's become 99% mental, 1% physical. You're not going to be doing uh, sprint work five minutes before your, your match, are you? No, you're not. You're going to be in your head. So the mind becomes more and more important the closer and closer we get to the event. Whether you're giving a speech or you're taking a driver's test or you're, or you're competing or you're, or you're fighting, whatever it is. It's more mentally stressful, obviously, the closer that you get. So it becomes more and more mental. But to ease this mental stress, you have to have first built a lot of confidence in the practice room. So whether you are practicing driving before your driving driver's test or rehearsing your speech before you're, you actually give your speech, the more competent you are, the more competent, the more times you've done something with success, the more confident you will you will be. So I always tell my students that, Confidence is competence. The more competence I develop in the practice room, the more confidence I should have. Not that I will have, I should have, I should. Now there's another element. Remember I said it's a two, two part process. Now, if you show incompetence in the practice room, if in the practice room you're getting taken down, you're getting choked out, you're losing all your matches, you're losing all your rounds, you're just doing horrible in the practice room, and you're confident on fight night, I think something's wrong with you. First of all, I think you have a false confidence. I don't believe in your confidence. I think your confidence is a lie. I think it's it's a, it's a mask. You know, you're just pretending to be confident. There's a confidence on top of a layer. Uh, excuse me. There's a layer of confidence on top of an ocean of doubt, and self criticism, and disbelief. Okay, so it's not real confidence. Real confidence. Like George told me once before a fight, George, I remember he told me, you know what the best, he asked me, he said, you know what the best feeling is before a fight? I said, what? He said, having real confidence. And I was like, I totally agree. I totally agree. That must be the greatest feeling. Knowing that you're super prepared, that the guy you're fighting doesn't have the answers 
to beat you. He doesn't have the answers to the questions you're going to pose on him on fight night, and you're very confident you're going to beat him. That must be a great feeling. So what I was saying is a two-part process. One, you have to show extreme competence to actually have authentic, true, 100% real confidence. And then the other process, the other point, the other, because uh, there is, there are guys who are really good in the practice room, they show extreme competence, and then on fight night, they panic. They panic. And what I'm about to share with you guys, it's an anecdote, it's a, it's not a, it's not a logical argument, it's not an empirical fact that you can verify, it's not a scientific uh, study. It's just my intuitive observation over the years, over training countless athletes, I, over the years, this is not verifiable scientifically, you know, it's not a logical argument. For those of you out there who know your epistemology, you know what I'm relying, I'm drawing on my intuition, my years and years of experience. And this is a very, very um, a legitimate way of knowing something. Intuition is a very legitimate way of knowing something, especially with somebody who has a lot, a lot of experience. So let me share my experience with you and just take it as that. I think that if you if you take what I'm about to share with you and and, and try it in the real world, you will uh, you will find a lot of success with this with this uh, these little tips. So, what it is is basically, we've all heard of flight or f fight or flight. You know, in psychology, the term is fight, flight, or freeze. They shortened it to fight, fight or flight, but the actual original term was fight, flight, or freeze, freeze. Okay. So <clears throat> now I majored in philosophy and philosophy. I, I specialize in Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy is the father of psychology. You know, if you take any course in psychology, it originates with Socrates because Socrates was the know thyself philosophy. It wasn't philosophy about the external world. Aristotle was more of a biologist, scientist, natural scientist, what, what they would call, the Greeks would have called a natural scientist. He was more interested in the world out there. He was more interested in the world, studying animals, frogs, nature, etc. The world out there, the bodily um, the stars, the body, the bodily, um, the the heavenly bodies, etc. Socrates is more interested about the mind, self-reflection, logic, reasoning, etc. Okay, now Aristotle also, but to a lesser degree. Okay, so we have fight, flight, or freeze. Now, of course, on fight night or the day of your competition, you want to take action. That's what fight is. You definitely don't want to run. You don't want to flight. Okay, you don't want to take off running. And you definitely don't want to freeze. Now, this is very um, beneficial for us in nature. Now, for instance, if you're coming across a predator in nature, it may be wise to run if you can seek shelter. If you can run to your shelter, close the door behind you and keep that animal outside, get away from the hungry wolves out there. And if you were able to run to the door, the distance is closer than they can get to you. Uh, maybe it's a wise choice to run. Uh, maybe it's a wise choice to freeze if you're walking in the grass and you see a snake. Maybe it's very wise for you just to freeze. And these elements, these deep, deeply programmed elements in our mind were very beneficial to us in nature. However, on fight night, I've seen many guys do all three. I've seen guys fight. No problem there. I've seen guys run in a fight. Their instincts just get the better of them. They want to fight back, but they just find themselves backpedaling. They find themselves literally running a few steps to try to disengage and just keep avoiding the fight at all costs. And then when you get them between rounds and you try to, you know, uh, knock some sense into them, you try to get them to move forward, it's just, it's just this blank. Their instincts are overrun. Now, I've had that experience as well. And I've had the experience of guys freezing. You know, they do so good in the practice room. And then on fight night, they get there and they get stage fright. They really literally do nothing. They throw no punches. They just hold on. They're like frozen. They just... They're, they're, they are not working. They're not working. They're not reacting. And it's a deep, at least as it appears to me, to be a deep psychological um, grip on their, on, their, on their skills. There's a mental grip holding back their skills. I've seen their skills in the practice room. I've seen the guy score double legs. I've seen the guy throw punches. I've seen the guy, you know, strike. I've seen him do 100. And then he freezes on fight night. Now, again, this happens to very few athletes, a very small amount, maybe, you know, a small percentage, one or two percent. But I've seen it. You know, I've coached thousands of, of fights. You know, I, I've done it. I've been doing it for so many years. And um, in my opinion, when you're in the, the locker room or before you go out, to give your speech or before you take your driver's test what chokes you up is that 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 nervous energy you have is just too much energy 
So you're sitting there, you're about to fight, you're about to perform in whatever whatever stage you're performing in. I don't care if you have a job interview or whatever it is. If you have too much energy, if you're too stressed, and you don't ventilate that energy, you don't you don't expend that energy. You might it might backfire on you. You might end up fleeing or freezing. Now, if you end up fighting, that's great. That's what we want you to do. You want to do it. I want you to do it. Your your training partners all we all want you to fight. We all want you to go out there and execute, do your best. However, you might freeze like a deer in the headlights, or you might run, get the sweats, and you wanna you wanna run away. Now, my energy, my, in my opinion, the answer is as simple as once you start feeling anxiety, get up and start moving. Get up and go spend that energy. If you have a fight and you're in the locker room and you start feeling stressed, get up, start shadow boxing. Get up. You have too much energy. And that having too much energy, it will feel like anxiety. Too much energy feels like anxiety. And, and I've had that personal experience. I had a, a huge fear of flying. And why, why did I have such a huge fear of flying? Well, one is when I'm sitting in the airplane and I start feeling anxiety. I cannot get up and start shadow boxing. I cannot go and do some drilling. I cannot uh, lift some weights. I cannot go do some sprints. I cannot expend any energy. I have to sit here in my chair. And that energy, that stress level starts to choke me up. And my heart started racing and I started sweating and all. I had a, I had a real phobia, a legitimate phobia of flying. And one day I'll, I'll tell you guys how I got over it. Now, I've, I mean, I've always faced my fears, even though I was petrified of flying, even though I had a severe fear of flying, I always got on that plane. I never succumbed to my fears. And um, now today I fly much more comfortably. I fly, you know, 30, 30, 40 times a year. I get on 30, 40 flights a year, but I had a tremendous, tremendous phobia. But again, I'll leave that story for another day. I don't want to go off on a tangent here. When you're in the locker room, you need to expend that energy. Don't wait for half an hour before your fight. Don't wait for an hour before a fight. If you get to the arena and it's four hours before your fight and you're feeling nervous, start shadow boxing. Start going through your warm-up routine. Just take the edge off. Expend some energy. If you have a big exam and you're really stressed out about it, jump on the treadmill. Run for 10, 20 minutes. You will feel invigorated. You will feel normal. You'll take a shower after. You'll feel great. Your nerves will have calmed down. There's a chemical process going on inside your mind. Your brain doesn't know if you want to run, if you want to freeze, or you want to fight. In my opinion, this is just an, an, an intuitive sense I have. Okay, Again, this is not a logical argument. This is not a scientific study. There's no way to verify this scientifically. There's no way for me to give you a logical argument. This is just my intuitive sense. When somebody's choked up, when somebody is too stressed, and you don't give them a way to vent it, you don't let them physically, physically exert the energy, Burn that energy. Take that edge off. In my opinion, they may freeze on you or they may run because they're, they're feeling such discomfort. Now, I've never had a single fighter. Now, think about this. I've never had a single fighter in between rounds tell me he's nervous. Once we're fighting, once the action is going, I've never had a single fighter tell me, coach, I'm too nervous to go out for round two. Never, not once. However, I have fighters that I've literally slapped in the face because they freeze and I want to take them out of their shock. And sometimes the slap between rounds wakes them up. It does. And it, it also hasn't in the past. Okay, but I've had better results snapping people out of it by kind of shaking them a bit and kind of snapping out of it because they go into a, a, a mode in their mind. And then later when they watch the fight, they're like, I can't believe I did that. I don't remember any of this. I don't remember. Any. So that's what they'll tell me. Though. I don't remember any of this. I don't remember backpedaling. I don't remember running back. I don't remember... Uh, shutting down like this. What was I doing? I lost total. I, I have no idea what they'll, they'll tell me though. The words, what I usually hear is I had no idea what happened. Now, in my opinion, the reason is their deepest instinctual reflexes kicked in. Now your body doesn't know if you want to fight, run or freeze. You got to tell it. So once you start moving around, your body's like, Hey, we're in a fight. Again, this is anecdotal. This is my own intuit intuitive understanding of the human body, the human psyche. If you're nervous and you start moving around, you start shadow boxing, you start pummeling, you start doing your armbar routine, your body's like, oh, we're fighting here. We're fighting. I've never had a guy do a long warm up and freeze. I've had guys freeze. And then after figuring this out, going deep inside my mind and like kind of observing and really questioning and questioning and question, I was like, you know what? The guy just froze because he's choked up with too much nerves. Let's spend that energy. That's what the why the body 
you know, if, if anybody's ever competed before, before an event, you feel the surge of energy, you feel this rush of energy. Now, some some professionals, some athletes report a down of energy, like a like a lethargic feeling. And I'll talk about that another day, okay? But a lot of fighters, most fighters will say they they have this adrenaline pump. And you got to take that edge off. You don't want to be, in my opinion, you don't want to be too high on energy and you don't want to be too low. Too low, some guys are napping before the match or a fight. Some guys literally go in the back room and sleep. And they're like, wake me up 20 minutes before. You know, some guys are like that. Believe it or not, there are guys like that. And in my opinion, those guys, they're slow starters. You know, they get up and they're like jabbing in round one. And by the, the time they get warmed up, the fight's over. Slow starters, in my opinion, they need to warm up. Do a vigorous warm up dynamic warm-up they need some plyometric work if you are a slow starter i will make you do explosive warm-up if you're a nervous guy and you freeze or you run in fights like you you've got you're a type of guy who gets overly nervous i will also use the same method i will bring your nerves down by making you exercise getting you a second wind i'll make the guy do two three rounds of pads hard pads like i'm talking about five minutes hard like he did a whole fight if the guy's a really nervous guy i'll make him do a whole fight give him a 45 minute break let him get his second wind and then I'm really confident he's going to throw in the fight. He's going to he's going to do he's going to live up to his potential. He's going to live up to what he did in the practice room. His skills will now translate. I had a lot of success with this method. Try it out. So my 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 answer to you is a very simple one. Let your body know it's time to to fight, not time to run, not time to freeze. And the way you're going to do that is by simulating a fight. Your body will know that you are fighting. Don't forget the human system is a brilliant one. It's a brilliant machine. The human body is a brilliant machine. Your body will know when it's time to fight as you are fighting. So just mimic fighting. The edge will go down and you will fight to your true potential. Make sure you've built tremendous amount of skill and confidence and competence, excuse me, and that'll translate to confidence. And on fight night, don't let the nerves of the fight night get to you. I like to rehearse my, my I like to tell my fighters, rehearse imagery, you know, all, all fighters, all, most mostly all fighters do that. I, I got to say like 80, 90% of fighters closer to the fight because we're doing less physical training. It's now time to get in your head and counter your opponent in your head and set up your double leg in your mind. They just rehearse it in your mind over and over again, what you're going to do on fight night. And on fight night, when it's 99% mental, the warm up is huge. And do an extended warm up. Fatigue yourself in the practice room. If you're overly nervous, excuse me, in the locker room, fatigue yourself in the locker room. Take a break and get your second wind. I promise you will perform a lot better if you do it this way. Why? Because it'll feel more like a sparring, it'll feel less like a fight. And there is a lot more to know about why we get nervous. Okay, of course, there's a lot more to know. And we're gonna talk about this nonstop on this channel. We're gonna talk about fighting and, and the mind non-stop on this channel but don't forget your deepest instinct is to fight flight or freeze <clears throat> program yourself to fight and uh, i'm sure you will find a lot of success doing that all right guys i've been going on for half an hour i'm going to answer just one more one more that was some great questions mac Macus, uh, mikas thank you here is uh matt maycock matt maycock asks excuse me i gotta keep remembering to keep my face closer to the mic do you think it's possible to train striking martial arts such as boxing, Muay Thai, etc. without developing brain damage from a casual practitioner and competitor point of view? Also, have you ever had serious concussion and what helps did you take that help? Did you did you take to help minimize the damage? Okay, you're asking me if I ever had a concussion. No, thankfully, I've never had a concussion. Um, can you train kickboxing and all those striking arts without brain damage? Absolutely, 100%. Yes. Unless I sound brain damaged to you, unless I sound brain dead to you, <laughs> I'm totally wrong. If I sound brain, de brain dead to you right now, please disregard any advice I'm about to give you. I think there are two, two major schools of thought on this, okay? One, in, especially in American boxing, in the West, boxing clubs, you go to boxing clubs, Put on your headgear, hit as hard as you want. We'll rock him, sock him. We hurt him. If I'm much better than you and you're here, I'm just going to club you. And if, you, if I stop you, too bad for you. And that's just the way it is. If you get your ass handed to you in practice, if we break your nose, if we break your jaw, next, bring in the next sparring partner. There are schools like that. There are a lot of schools like that. TriStar is not like that. TriStar is the opposite. If you look at the Cuban school of boxing or in Thailand, the Thai boxing, it's the sparring is more play. It's more touch sparring. 
If you look at a lot of uh, karate schools, etc., it's more touch sparring, more play sparring. Now, at TriStar, we have both. We have touch sparring, all levels sparring. So every level, you could be your first day you're going to spar. It's just touch. We don't hit hard. We do not hit hard. We just touch. It's footwork, touching. Uh, there's we, we just we don't we don't transfer the body weight. It's plenty plenty of sparring rounds without the violence, and you will keep your brain intact. Now we also have advanced sparring and pro sparring at TriStar. We put the headgear on. You can hit a lot harder, uh, but that's only for very seasoned individuals, and that's something we do sp sp uh, periodically, like once twice a week. We don't do that every day. Now touch sparring you can do almost every single day. You won't get your brain. Uh, jarred okay so I do a lot of touch sparring personally I spar regularly two three times a week I do a lot a lot of rounds of sparring I'm a big believer in sparring however I don't believe in beating the body down a sparring workout especially a touch sparring workout you should get a crazy amount of, of work in you should get a lot of rounds in you should sweat like crazy you should lose a lot of weight you should feel good and you should not be banged up the next day. Okay, so for those of you who are in Montreal area and you, you want to spar, I get this. People ask me all the time. We do touch sparring on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at TriStar Gym. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. The, the, the gym is packed to the brim. And it's just friendly sparring. It's just friendly sparring. Everybody has the proper gear. We don't wear headgear because we're not going hard. And the guys who know each other, who've done a lot of rounds together, they can go a little bit harder, you know. But the, the vast majority of the club, especially the beginners... It's just touch, and there's no brain damage. There's no concussions. If guys who go too hard, we I, I throw them off the mat. I give them warnings. I give them a you know an adult version of a timeout until they learn how to touch bar. And when they learn how to touch bar, they can join the mat, and we can have a proper session. And I do a tremendous amount of touch barring. And once in a while, once I'm really warmed up, I'll tell the guy, "Hey, let's go hard this round. You know, let's just pick it up." And you don't need a lot of hard rounds, in my opinion. You need a lot of sparring rounds, and then a a handful of hard rounds in a month or a week and save those brain cells. Now, I got fighters in the gym. They just want to go hard all the time. And I tell them, okay, if you want to go hard on the, all the time, come to pro sparring. That's the day we put on the proper equipment and we go hard. I believe that the more experience you have, the less hard sparring you need. So if you're a total beginner, you should start with touch sparring because you're a beginner. And after you reach a certain level of competence, you should go to the advanced class, do a handful of hard sparring rounds a week. A handful, okay? And then as you get more and more seasoned, you'll, le you'll need less of that hard sparring. So you got to build up to a le certain level of competence to actually have hard sparring. But once you have hard sparring, you do it for a few years, and then after you need less of it. You understand the differences between touch sparring and hard sparring, and you can translate what will work in a real fight and what won't work because the problem with touch sparring all the time is you might be doing things creating ha bad habits that don't work when the intensity is on but we can weed all that out with the hard sparring okay especially somebody with a lot of experience he knows that certain little tricks and, and moves won't work if the guy's really throwing real heat he just knows it because he's tried it in real sparring and it backfired and he, he learned to stay away from that okay so there's pros and cons to both touch sparring and hard sparring. We need a little bit of hard sparring. You need those brain cells. I know guys that, you know, they did themselves a disservice from sparring hard all the time. Not because they're brain dead, but because their bodies are a wreck. They finally got good and now their shoulders are wrecked, their, their jaws are wrecked, their knees are wrecked, their backs are wrecked, their ribs are wrecked. Listen, I'm nearly 40. I'm nearly 40. I feel the same. My body is just as healthy as when I was 18. I do the same. I do actually more training than when I was 18. I spar. I wrestle. I do jujitsu. I have no joint pain. I have no back pain. I have no sciatica. I have no neck pain. I have no brain problems that I know of. Okay, unless I sound like a total, total punch drunk. Uh, you know, don't take any of my advice. Okay, but I do a lot of flow rolling, and I do a handful of hard rounds. Okay, once I'm really warmed up from the flow rolling, and I don't tell people I'm flow rolling. When I, when I roll with people, I reach a level of jiu-jitsu now that I just let them roll, and I flow roll. I personally flow roll. I'm just kind of flowing and blocking and sweeping them gently and kind of letting them work a bit. And when I'm really warmed up, I'll start to turn it up. And then I'll just start hunting for the sub after sub. and I'll, just, You know, but I'm going to warm up. Why? Because I've been doing this a long time. And I know that if I don't warm up, tomorrow I'm going to be sore. Tomorrow I'm going to be tight. I don't want that. I've been around the block too many times. Okay, so there, you need a certain level of experience to get to this point. But once you do, you got to save the wear and tear, save the brain cells, and find the school that allow that cultivates 
touch sparring and control, controlled sparring. In my jiu-jitsu class, the same thing. We have a beginner's class. If you're a beginner, I don't want some guy just crushing you. You know, I don't want that. It doesn't do any good for you. It doesn't do any good for him. We have a beginner's course, Tuesdays and Thursdays, beginner's course. Then we have all levels courses. And then we have intermediate and advanced courses. You need the appropriate level of education for the appropriate level of experience that you have. I can't teach the basics to the guys who are brown belts. They're going to be bored out of their minds. I got to show that to the beginners. So everything has to be appropriate. Everything has to be set up appropriately. If you're really skilled, touch spar and just do a handful of hard rounds during the week. Just a handful. You know, a guy you know, a guy you trust that won't, you know, do anything crazy. And uh, this is my opinion. The road to mastery. You want to reach mastery and be healthy. You don't want to reach mastery and say, oh, I can't use these skills. I took 10 years to get these skills. Now I can't use them. Why? Because my back is broken. My neck is in pain. I can't, I can't do any uh, more jujitsu. I finally reached the understanding. I could finally have uh, a credible experience now on the mat. I could finally you know, use all these skills that I've been building all these years. Oh, no, sorry. You're, you have the two herniated discs in your neck and um, all these skills that you've been cultivating for 10 years, throw them in the garbage. You can't use them. You know, it's just absurd to me. And you know what? The, the, the truth of the matter is, once you reach black belt, that's the beginning. That's really the beginning. Black belt. When I got my black belt, I finally understood. I started to understand what training is about. And I think black belt is not the, the end all be all. It's just the beginning. It's a, it's a phenomenal achievement to have in life. In my opinion, if a true black belt is like getting a PhD. A true black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, in my opinion, is like the equivalent of getting a PhD. It's, it's that significant. And... Um, I recommend it to all jiu-jitsu practitioners. Get to your black belt and, and do it legitimately. Don't go to some guy who's just taking your membership fees and he keeps giving you stripes every so often and, and your jiu-jitsu is very weak and he's still promoting you. That guy is just putting money in his bank account. Get a legitimate black belt, respectable black belt. Do it. You can do it. You absolutely can. Don't sell yourself short. Do the drills. Go through the fire and, and turn into iron. Go through with the process and get your black belt. Get a legitimate black belt and be healthy once you get it. To be healthy, you need to be smart. Once you reach an adequate level of skill, purple belts, in my opinion, should flow roll on a regular basis. You understand that intensity makes a difference and you can manage it. Do a handful of hard rounds, absolutely. Stay intense, absolutely, without a doubt. However, however, don't do it every single... Like, I mean, don't just slam your body against the wall. All right, guys, I hope I didn't ramble on too much. Thank you all for tuning in. Like, share, comment as usual. Send me those questions in the link, of the email in the description, and I will see you all in the next episode. Thank you. Bonjour, mon nom est Marc Elie Toussaint. Je suis entraîneur de sprint depuis 23 ans. Je travaille au niveau de la vitesse avec Georges Saint-Pierre depuis 4 ans. Euh, je viens de tester le Tim Tam, c'est le meilleur instrument au niveau du relâchement musculaire que j'ai testé de toute ma carrière. Je le recommande à tous. When you train a lot, you get tight. The best way to loose up your muscle is the Tim Tam. Hi, I'm Jean Saint-Pierre. I'm using the Tim Tam machine after my training to help me with my recovery.